Okay, yeah, so the plan for today is uh, Noel's pulling it up now, but we're going to give you guys a commercial update on what the market's been doing in the last quarter or so. Uh, I personally have experienced a lot of activity, so people are definitely feeling more confident after the new year. It's, it's almost as if somebody flipped the switch. My business, uh, you know, practically doubled overnight. So I've been, you know, working nonstop since the new year. People are, uh, you know, both tenants and buyers are feeling much more confident in the economy moving forward and that we're on the tail end of kind of conquering the virus and, you know, COVID restrictions being lifted, hopefully in the not too distant future. So it's been, you know, that plus, you know, a lot of stimulus money floating in the economy, a low interest rate still. Um, has got people wanting to do deals. What I also heard today, I heard this from one of my IF guys, is that hard money lenders are desperate for business because there's so few bank owns out there and there's so few investors buying money, they have no place to place their money. So you see rates even of those lend loaners have come down and are willing to do, but they, they weren't willing to do before. I see a lot of cash out refinances, and a lot more stuff out there that wasn't out there available before. So, Baldo, you might be getting financing for your, your, your piece of junk you have in Lane City. Yeah. <laughs> and so then uh, once we kind of go over with the market update, we're going to open up the floor to everybody who has any commercial-based question at all or generally about real estate. So while Noel's pulling that up, if you guys have questions now, we'd be more happy yeah. to understand them. So what I have is more or less going over the capital markets, capital markets and the overview of the overall market. But it's not based on our area. It's the whole Philadelphia region, which includes part of our area as well. And just so you guys know, in Atlanta County, anything from multifamily, there's very few properties multifamily outside of Atlantic City. So if you do, if you have a client that says to you, hey, I want to find a multifamily, but I want to be in a city, you're going to be hard pressed to find anything. Um, you will find some in Mays Landing, Hamilton, um, and anything else, mixed use, you have more of a chance of finding than you do just straight multifamily. North yeah, and in commercial, in commercial, we consider multifamily anything five units or above. Most of the big players they want to see 20 units and above which is even rare in our area uh you'll see a lot more inventory in philly or up north jersey new york area uh, but in our area finding even a five to ten unit uh proves this difficult at times and then from above that you do have the large large mm -hmm. multifamily development department complexes especially in pleasant mill you've got about seven different apartment complexes in Pleasant Mill of the large multifamily, but then you're talking and you're getting into your five to $20 million range. Is anybody on the call working on any commercial things or have potential commercial properties? It's not you, Bob, we're, we're not talking about that junker. It all counts, no. He's not getting paid on it. it doesn't count. <laughs> all right, he's doing, he's doing it pro bono. Yeah. Did your dad take that offer, by the way, Baldo? Well, we have um, – we got one right now for um, – the original time they came at us with 380, 390, that was, you know, they were just trying to get us to sign the intent so we couldn't show it to anybody else. But then um, after they came down and, and checked it out, um, you know, they had – because of all the work that potentially needed to be done, they were saying 310, then they said 300. Now we got them back up to 320. And um, that's pretty much the number we're at. We're trying to get 325. We're seeing what he says. But um, we had another couple calls that came in. Um, you know, my brother was taking it because he set up the whole Zillow thing with my dad. Um, so I'm not sure. I was talking, I actually mentioned something to Noel like, this the lady that was they had a calling on behalf was from Nigeria and you know 
she's like, oh, no, my guy's from North Jersey. You know, they mean business, blah, blah, blah. But like, how do you handle those out of town? You know, Noel gave me a couple of things like make sure, you know, it sounds like a whole set down, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if you have any input on out of region wholesale, you know, middlemen or anything like that. If you get approached. Well, I, I can tell you from my experience that there's been a lot of interest from out of town, just from, especially in the Atlantic city market specifically, because everybody has heard of Atlantic city, regardless of what part of the country you're in. And for the most part, even before the pandemic, North Jersey, New York city area, Long Island has been pretty priced out. Like you were getting bottom barrel returns, single digit rate returns. So for a lot of those people, they were looking for opportunity. They just didn't feel like they had enough safety margin. And, you know, I think uh, two or three years ago, Atlantic City was a great deal. Now it's kind of fairly priced, but for them, it's still a great deal because, you know, you're earning 10%, 12% in Atlantic City where they're earning like five to 6% in New York if they're lucky. So for them, they're doubling their return. Um, I think down here, we got kind of used to making 15, 20, 30% returns on a lot of these properties. So we, we were spoiled for a very long time. Um, so now they're coming down. So in my experience, th these people tend to do mean business. They then do have cash and um, these price points don't scare them. The problem is when they come down here, they underestimate the, the amount of time and money it's gonna cost to get a property up to code and the level of bureaucracy actually rent something, whether it's a complete commercial tenant, like a little pizza shop or something going in, you know, or just a regular, you know, uh, tenant, you know, a residential apartment. Um, so then when they come down to like the site on scene offers, I, I take them with a, you know, big grain of salt that, you know, until you actually see them walk through the property, it might look great from outside, but then you're like, oh, it's smaller or it's in worse shape. You know, my offer changes now. So it's like we were negotiating, wasting time. Well, at least I know we're in the ballpark, but I expect them to, whether them directly or their representative to come down and take a look at it. Gotcha. Oh, great question though. A anybody else working with out of town investors? Uh, or just out of towners who want to come and uh, move into the area? I'm going to mute myself for a moment. Uh, I have a question. Um, what are the different classifications of commercial property and their uses, I guess? Okay, great question. Uh, does anybody know the, the basic uh, property classes? You see, I watched that video. Um, <laughs> you sent me that was pretty good with the, you're talking about the A, B, C, and D? Okay, yeah. So there, okay, so there's like, there's property, um, Conditions, and then there's uh, there's different property categories. So, uh, Quinn, what were you referring to exactly? Are you talking about property uses, like multifamily yeah, so like versus is every? Is every commercial property generally can that be used for the same type of like a warehouse can't be used for? Okay, okay, great. So yeah, gotcha. So Quinn is referring to the actual property class use. So typically there's three main categories. There's uh, retail, multifamily, and industrial. Okay. Can anybody give me examples of those three? And then there's subcategories or overlap categories. Oh, and there's office. Sorry, I forgot about office. So office, retail, multifamily, and industrial. And so wait, typically it's a hard question to say yes and no because sometimes it really depends on the local zoning uh how the property was built sometimes it's not the highest and best use and there's more need for one category over the other so like for example industrial uh warehouse like the amazon type you know where shippers direct uh, delivery to the consumer has been on a tear lately uh, even before the pandemic, but the pandemic kind of accelerated that. So that has been the hottest product, uh, property class category in the, you know, commercial real estate market. Has anyone guessed what the weakest has been lately? Retail. Retail and office. Yep. 
Uh, everybody's working from home and getting stuff delivered by Amazon. So retail and office has been taking the biggest hits. And of course, multifamily is just apartments. So then you'll have uh, subcategories like mixed use, which is like more than one property class. It typically is uh, retail on the plus, you know, it's retail on the first floor and like apartments above, but it can also be retail on the first floor and office above. Um, then you have specialty uses like a hospital. Um, you have single tenant buildings like a CBS pharmacy or uh, Burger King, any quick service restaurants. Um, does that kind of explain, you know, answer your question, Quinn? Yes. Great. Wait, I, I want to throw something in here for Quinn as well, okay? So a lot of investors will take properties from one, from one <laughs> direction to another direction. So a warehouse, depending upon how it lays out, can actually be converted into residential. You'll see a lot of the of warehouses in Philadelphia that actually take that old warehouse buildings and make them lofts or different types like that. I have an investor that takes office buildings or office complexes and turns them into residential units. So what it is does not mean it's its highest and best use. Yep, absolutely, kind of yeah. And that, there's huge opportunities in converting retail or hotel space, which is another specialty use, hospitality. Um, what Baldo was referring to was the condition of the property. So they're rated on an A, B, C, uh, and D system. So A, of course, is top tier, you know, built in the last 15 or 20 years or recently renovated uh, from the ground up kind of construction. Usually in, a, in, you know, both the property class and the neighborhood are both have ratings depending on income and uh you know different quality settings so, so of course the higher the class the the more expensive the property is but also the uh the lower the risk so back to going to the quinn asked do you need to get approvals or permits to change it you would need a variance in actual zoning okay. but these guys are most most investors are doing this are well versed and speak to the city in advance before they take on that kind of project okay and the zoning may have already changed. Uh, you won't know until you look up the zoning. Like it could be a uh, hundred year old warehouse where it was built before zoning and the property is already uh, qualified for residential use. You just have to submit the permits and get the okays, from the zoning board and the uh, construction department. So keep that in mind. Yeah, rezoning a property is a is a long arduous task that's very difficult. It's an uphill battle, but sometimes you could use the, the zone existing zoning to your benefit. It might take some uh, changing of your plan, but it could definitely work. So, um, can I just ask a question? Is that um, would that be a example of? Uh, I think probably more in like Northern Jersey and, and maybe in Philly where they have a older factory that they're now um, turning over into <clears throat> residential like custom lofts and stuff like that. Uh, that has been the case in those areas for a while. Um, you're starting to see it only recently in New Jersey or South Jersey, I should say, because there's not that many factories. Um, the closest comparison I would say is probably uh, Camden Waterfront. You see a lot of loft going up right by that Rutgers University campus, right on the waterfront there. Um, around here, you don't really see it. We never had a lot of factories to begin with. Um, the only thing I could think of would make a cool development would be the old cotton mill in Mays Landy, which is right on Lake Lenape there. That would be a cool like loft development. Um, I'm guessing it's uh, one, there's not a lot of demand and two, there's probably so many environmental issues uh, with that building. So that's the other issue. When you do a project that's already pre-existing, you, you kind of inherit all the issues and problems that that building has, not only zoning, but environmental. Um, they didn't really know about the issues and quite frankly, probably didn't care <laughs> about what happened in the future. So like, you know, asbestos and lead paint and oil um, are all contaminants you have to be concerned with when dealing with older buildings you're trying to convert. Quinn's got another question regarding the uh, what questions to ask when people come in. So Quinn, go ahead. Okay, so I'm not familiar with uh, commercial at all. So if I have a if I've been 
uh, people that want to come and they want to possibly um, lease commercial for for like something that they want to you know house a couple of their things in there how do I know what to ask as far as like if I'm looking for a warehouse am I like what am I looking for that I need to I need to know to ask these questions um you would need to get a in-depth uh perspective on what they're trying to do what their end goals are and really understand what their business they're getting into so what, what, what kind of products <laughs> yeah if, if, if you don't even know the questions to ask you're at the point and this is not your fault whatsoever but you're you're so new that you're you're kind of don't know what you don't know right so at first you're gonna have to ask what business they're in right what product or services are they providing to the market how are they providing it and what property needs do they have so it's a little hard you with commercial not only do you need to know the real estate if you get into commercial leasing which is what i do a lot of not only do you need to know property like zoning and classification and rental rates and so forth you need to know a lot about business because you've got to be able to solve that business's needs it's a business need that you're solving for with property right so you may have a tenant that is totally fine they tell me oh i need a uh, 5,000 square feet commercial office space within a five mile radius of Atlantic City. Okay, great. That's really sounds specific, but it's not specific at all. Um, because some of them might need a certain heights, right? If I'm uh, uh, and picking items by hand, I know a 14 foot ceiling uh, height is totally fine. But if I'm a huge operator, that does a lot of volume and needs to stack big containers, I may need 30 foot ceilings like an Amazon warehouse mm -hmm. would need, right? Uh, so ceiling heights, door widths, uh, loading requirements. Are they using box trucks? Are they using 53 foot trailers? Or are they picking up stuff and bringing it with their own pickup truck? So those kind of requirements are all need to be hashed out. Are they actually just shipping things and receiving them? You know, it's all online orders or are they having customers pick up there? Because sometimes, uh, you know, certain facilities don't allow for unauthorized personnel to enter. So I had to do a deal, we were looking for space, but um, it fit our budget, it fit our, our location needs, but the entire parking lot was fenced in and had gated security 24 hours a day because most of the other tenants were defense contractors. So my tenant needed free access. They had uh, different workers. They couldn't pre-screen and have like an, you know, a week to two week kind of backlog on them getting the security clearance to uh, get in and out of the, you know, parking facility. So it, it didn't make sense. Um, so those specific granular details uh, for your tenant, and sometimes your tenant doesn't even know if this is their first commercial property deal and they're just starting a business out, they may not have a clue until they get into it. And these are the questions you have to ask so they really think about it. And they might have to call their vendors determine what kind of trucks they're bringing their product in or what kind of use they're going to really expand their business so they don't get into a point where they sign a five-year deal and to rent space and two years out they're already outgrown the space what their needs are and they're looking to get out of their lease or sublease their deal so it's important to, to make sure that you ask questions just like residential real estate you have to ask your questions yeah it's just like knowing in residential, how many bedrooms and baths, what kind of school districts, you know, they need a extra wide driveway because the, you know, the husband drives a tractor trailer for a living. You know, those kind of questions that may be second nature in residential and you can pick up along the way, you really need to know from the get-go in commercial. <laughs> Thanks, Ray, appreciate the comment. So this was something pretty cool. I, I just got I just got from uh, the multi about vacancy. I'm gonna share it to the screen right now. What you got for us? Beam on what's up? No. About vacancy. Okay. Can you see my screen? Come where you say it. Yep. Okay. Philadelphia multifamily vacancy.
Now, part of this, what I read here is that we should be taking advantage on the residential side of these people that are renting in and are running in complexes that can actually afford a house now if they couldn't afford before. So uh, if you guys are reading this, what does this tell you? This probably alludes to the residential market too. So if I read this, this is saying that the vacancy has risen from five to 10%. Uh, so nearly doubled, uh, which is a big increase in uh, the multifamily world, especially on a stabilized property. That's another term you have to look for. So usually in uh, commercial, especially in multifamily, they have stabilized value add and opportunistic. Can anybody guess what uh, what the differences in those properties might be? And the investors who would invest in them? Well, so the first one's easy, stabilized. What does stabilized mean? Stability. You don't know? <laughs> okay, that's a fair answer. Uh, stabilized, just like it implies is a stabilized, uh, the property has stability, meaning it's fully rented out. Any repairs or issues with the CEO have been taken care of. It's, uh, you know, easy money maker kind of mailbox money type of property. Market Ease. rents. Sorry? Market rents too, not under market, market rents. Yep, market rents, um, management not management intensive it's already whatever issues the property had it needs to be redeveloped and zoned, and yada yada has been taken care of by the prior owner it's a money maker but guess what the risk has been reduced which also results in what else being reduced income uh, not the income though close though close the income stay the income has been increased, so there's less upside, there's less risk. So what does that mean? Who's that going to attract? Everybody wants easy money, right? So it's going to attract all the investors, and it's going to go for a premium, meaning the return is also going to be lower. These type of properties are bought by uh, investors who want to invest in real estate for stability. They want to preserve their capital. They want to grow it over the rate of inflation. They want an income producing property. They're not really looking to make market beating returns. But these are like big, on the bigger side, these are big institutional funds, life insurance companies, right? Pension funds. On the smaller end, it's probably lawyers, doctors, uh, trust fund babies, people with money that they're looking to continue and preserve and not really put at risk. Uh, you know, property going up and down in value, dealing with tenants. When they're making a couple hundred thousand plus a year, it's probably the last thing they want to worry about. The next uh, class or category is value add, which is a big, it's taken over a life of its own for people breaking into commercial, um, which is a little different from opportunistic. So value add is kind of in the, re in the residential side would be like the cosmetic rehab properties, right? They're making money, they just have a lot of vacancy or a lot of turnover. They need to be brought up to market standards, right? Or, or, it's, a, or it's rented out, Baldo, your, your dad's property is kind of borderline that. Um, they've had the same tenants for 20 years and the rents were cheap 20 years ago and now it's, uh, they're practically nothing compared to market rates. So uh, the property needs to be updated. Uh, uh, tenants need to be brought up to market rent in order for it to be stabilized and producing what it should be. And of course the opportunistic properties, those are the ones I love to deal with. Those are high risk, high reward. Uh, usually the property is completely vacant, needs a complete gut rehab, practically ready to fall down and kill somebody and uh, needs a full gut rehab. That's where I come in. Uh, those are the properties that'll sell very cheaply and has a huge amount of return. But if you're not careful, the risk is also there too. So, but the word cheap is not is under is understated. So it's not a cheap, it's a it's less than market. So it still could be a million dollar property, two million, oh, three million. Absolutely. It's the it's the return on investment. And then they're much more management intensive. You can't just buy them and expect that tenants are going to come to you or you can hire a, a realtor and, and it'll be fine. Like you got to pull money out. So there is a uh, commercial property. You used to have an old uh, Acme and Kmart 
on Route 30 in Berlin, it basically, uh, I think the Kmart closed years ago, like maybe five or 10 years ago. Um, it was slow even then, but uh, the property is right on the main road, right before the 73 exit. The investors who just bought it two months ago got it for 1.45 million. So this is an opportunistic deal because it's over two, close to 200,000 square feet. Of which, uh, on the other side, they have a fully functioning Italian restaurant, dollar store, and a couple other small towns. Things like a Chinese restaurant and a uh, dry cleaners. So essentially, it's two shopping centers. One, they basically bought one and got the other one for free. But they're going to be putting half a million to a million dollars on the other side in order to get a rent ready. And it's not just signing the checks, but you have to uh, know who to call and what to do. So they pulled up the old. Uh, BCT tile on the floor, which was installed in the 80s. They found a small amount of asbestos in the actual glue. Um, so they had to do a, an asbestos remediation. Now uh, we're negotiating with them to at least 90,000 square feet for a uh, indoor go-kart and basketball um, client that I have. So we're going back and forth negotiating. So these are the properties where you could make kind of generational wealth, but they're also very management intensive. So if you don't have a lot of time, you're not already in the real estate field, there's gonna take up a lot of time. You need to partner up with somebody who has that experience and knows um, how to get these properties turned around. So now a lot of like, it's also attorney based. So a lot of stuff you do is yeah. all through attorneys. So attorneys get involved in the final contract and lease uh, writing. But you could still find the properties, negotiate with the landlords, negotiate with the buyers and sellers, and write up a, kind of an offer. It's, we call it a LOI, a letter of intent. Um, and then the, once you have kind of the deal terms, the attorney uses that to draft. Sometimes they'll get involved in the negotiation of that. But those deal terms are used to draft the, either the lease or the sales agreement, depending on what you're doing. Is that also known as a prospectus? Uh, a prospectus is generally when you're selling securities. So if you're selling shares of equity or debts into a deal, that's when you'll usually get a prospectus. If you ever buy like an IPO, like a stock or a bond, you could also do that for a real estate investment trust or a syndicated deal. Like if they're trying to get 10 investors in to buy a shopping center. That's when you might see a prospectus. Uh, you're more likely on the real estate side to see a term sheet um, from a lender to show what the terms of the deal might be or from an actual buyer purchaser. Great question, though. Any other questions out there? I got one. I don't know if this is a, or if you guys had experience with this. How is like, for example, if somebody owns like a bar or something like that, how is that valued and what is the process? Is it a pain to, you know, come up with the estimated value of the business, et cetera? Or how is that whole, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so that, that's another area that I tackle. Actually, most realtors don't even touch those things. That's a uh, business brokerage where you're actually selling the business assets. So a bar or restaurant is one of the hardest things to value get idea especially with a bar with the liquor license values in new jersey but uh, you kind of do similar valuation that you do in real estate right you do an income valuation you figure out how much this sucker is actually making like real terms uh and you have to subtract out the cost of the owner's time so if the owner actively works in the business on a daily basis you got to figure out what a true salary and replacement costs for that owner's labor would be to determine a true net profit. And then kind of usually you have a multiple of that yearly net profit is what a business would sell for. So, you know, and usually in a restaurant bar, it's like two to three times the annual net profit. But is a good kind of rule of thumb. Some guys are not as sophisticated and they'll, they'll do a kind of markup on sales, you know, like 10 times to 20 times weekly sales. There's different like, uh, rules of thumb or valuation techniques that people use, but the net profit is the name of the game. When a business isn't doing as well, like what do you do if the bar shut down because of COVID? So 
So sometimes you'll look at, um, just like an appraiser, look at a property for replacement costs. If you literally had to buy all the things in the bar to set up a bar from scratch, what would they cost? And so sometimes if you get a property for less than the cost of all the items in it, um, that could be considered a good deal. Like we had, uh, Noel and I just sold our liquor license in Galloway uh, about a month and a half ago. And uh, not even, it's been about a month now. Um, and the purchaser of the liquor license is not even in the restaurant business. He's a contractor and he just bought it as an investment. He thought it was so cheap uh, that he's going to hold on to it for a year or so and then try to resell it for a profit. The so Mormon um, gave an offer for 40000 above what he paid. He, he turned it down. Really? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I got him an offer uh, for a, a lot more than he paid. I figured he would jump at it to, to make quick, easy money, but I guess he thinks it's worth more. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, so usually you'll have to take into consideration. And a lot of times with those prop, oh, you got to also look at the property, right? That's a big key of those uh, investments is do they own the property? If they don't, and even if they do, what are the property costs? You gotta look at the overhead costs. Are they within market, below market, above market? If you have a property where the taxes are killing you every month and you're not making enough money to cover it, or the rent is way out of line because they signed a deal when everything was going great, um, that's gonna negatively impact the value of the property. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a pizzeria for sale in Sickleville, not too far from my house. The rent is way above anybody would be considering, but even when the business was open and operational, it had since shut down and nobody wants to touch it. Uh, we're selling the, the assets are all there. You could turn around and get the power on and, and start making pizzas and Italian dishes tomorrow. Um, but the rent is so high, you know, we're selling it for 30 cents on the dollar. Nobody wants to touch it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, from where do you think it has to do with that? There can only be at, Right now, 50% occupancy. I mean, once they're 100%, does that make any more yeah. sense? Um, I think the problem is the sticker price scares a lot of people off. So a lot of guys in that business aren't really sophisticated and look at, you know, price per square foot and term. And they're like, oh, how much is my total nut every month? Like, what do I have to actually write the check for? You tell them a certain number and they had a different number in mind and it's just kind of more perception issue than kind of a uh, value right, so, to a lot. So just like your own buyers right now, residential buyers, and you come in a market, they're like, that shack, $250,000? Well, that's what the market is right now. So but the yeah. retail market, even though it should come down a little bit, it won't come down enough because the same shopping center owners, same owners have to keep a certain number for their own lenders. Yeah, that's the other problem. So a lot of these shopping center guys, they don't have one loan for one place and they want to maximize their cash flow. They have like this particular guy must have like 50 of these shopping centers all over the state. And he might have the same lender on a lot of them. So if his financial, they, look, they expect a certain level of vacancy regardless of how good of a, of a landlord or, you know, real estate manager you are. So it actually doesn't really benefit him to the lenders to have 100% occupancy because they're going to probably give him a 10 or 15% vacancy rate regardless, even in the best markets. So if he's dropping his rent rate, that's going to make his total rent um, or financial stability of the property weakened. And they might call in his loan for that property or all his other properties. And, uh, you know, that's a risk and a weird thing you wouldn't consider. It's almost like the lender is a partner in the deal. And I've even seen lenders where they have to kind of okay a new lease before we can make a deal done. They can, they can easier give a free month's rent or a few, a few months' rent rather than actually lower the lease because it's overall net terms. And you got to be careful on uh, how you answer certain questions because a lot of times they'll consider uh, a lease affordable if it's less than 10% of your sales, gross sales. So for a lot of... Uh, restaurants or uh, mm -hmm. pizza or bar guys, they, they don't want to pay anywhere near 10%. They want their total occupancy, including their utility bills to be included in the 10%. Uh, so that's the issue as well. Even though they're making higher sales, their profit might not necessarily be higher. So they have to uh, watch that total rent figure that they're paying. But getting information, that's the key to anything you do in commercial real estate is whether it's for a buyer or for a seller, Without detailed information, your hands are tied. 
like like the restaurant bar we had, we had trouble getting the information from the seller, and it took too long to get it. By the time we got it, the value was two hundred fifty. What did we sell it at? Ninety, hundred and five. Hundred and five. Yep. Right. We started at two fifty. So. Yeah, so a lot of times it's uh, it's getting direct to the source. So I asked for the lease on the initial um, meeting. I asked for a copy of the real estate taxes, a copy of all the bills, uh, just to kind of make that determination. And then I asked for the contact. Like, if there's a partner involved, I want their name and phone number and email. If there's a landlord, I want the same contact. Um, get as much information because eventually once you get a lead on it, they're going to want to know all that information. And then you had it with, with the restaurant, you had three brothers or three people, three partners involved. It made it just as hard to deal with. Are you people? Yeah. Okay. yeah nice. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna get, uh, Sorry, I was showing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, you're going to have people and it's, uh, you might have one owner who's gung ho and then the other two don't really want to sell it, but they're kind of forced to sell it. And, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to have that conversation once you have a buyer looking at it and on the table. So you're going to make sure that everybody's on board with what you're doing. And you have to fit the concept to the area or the area to the concept, right? So I had one guy, he was uh, looking for a smaller location, 1,000, 1,100 square feet. This place is 2,250. Um, and he's like, oh, he's like, he's doing a natural 11 pie, like, you know, pizza, like uh, closest thing around here. I don't know if you guys have tried bake, Bakeria 1010 at the uh, Linwood Exchange, but he does that kind of style pizza. But I'm like, well, I'm like, you know, this area is kind of middle income. He's like, yeah, my pies are go for 22 and up. I'm like, yeah, this is uh, probably out of the price point for the average person. So even though it's a nicer shopping center and there's money in town, it's not enough for him to kind of stabilize a $22 per pie price point. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's about if you're going to go into an area and then regardless of business, right, it could be um, a boutique store. You got if you're very um, focused on the type of of uh, the type of concept you have, you should have an ideal client avatar, the type of customer you're going to reach. And you have to match the location to that avatar. Okay. Same thing in real estate, right? If you're a meat and potatoes kind of realtor and you're used to dealing with a blue collar type of entry level price point, um, you're probably not going to spend a lot of marketing on the island and vice versa, right? If you're a luxury realtor, you're not going to target first time home buyer and lower level price points. So same thing with commercial, right? You got to target the, the right areas for that particular concept. Guys, I have a question. Yes. So take for it. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Take, for instance, uh, Tilton Road. I mean, <clears throat> it looks really old. <laughs> yeah. Um, and worn In down. Office? No, actually, that is one of the, the better looking ones. Don't talk about an old like that. He's right here. <laughs> Your stage set up behind you. Um, no. Um, I mean, what are the possibilities of our area getting more current? Like, what is the time frame? out and the possibilities of our area getting more current and looking more like a cherry hill or offering more diversions and stuff and Noel is already shaking his head no. um it's gonna it, it's gonna depend on a lot of factors so you have like a top down and a bottom up approach right so you'll have people who are like uh you know we need more government support and economic development loans and uh, infrastructure improvements, which is very true. Um, that strategy has been tried in Camden for like 30 years and with mixed results. Uh, and then you'll have areas that just pop up naturally. One person makes an investment and attracts other people to live, work, or play there. And all of a sudden, other people want a piece of the pie and end up making more investments. So ideally, when both factors are at play, when there's kind of a government or industry support, and there's people naturally that are picking it up and making the entrepreneurial kind of risk investment, those are ideal. Um, the problem with Tilton Road specifically is that a lot of these shopping centers were built in the 70s and 80s uh, where the parking requirements were ridiculous. And they wanted like seven parking spots per person or something. And so you have like Tilton 9 shopping center is like a mile away from the street. You could barely see what's in there. 
because they wanted to have enough parking that if you had a rock concert in there, you'd have a parking space for every person, including the baby. Um, so that that's the issue. Those are hard to redevelop. Uh, you'll see a lot of developments that are much, they're facing parallel to the street and they're much closer with less parking. And that way that'll leave other options in the back where you'll have like a city in the suburbs kind of feel where you might have retail or office up front and then you have apartments or houses in the back. And that way you can walk to the daycare. You have a, a dry cleaner or a restaurant up front that you could attend to, you know. So um, um, it, we have a lot of vacancies. I mean, I think marijuana legalization is going to help a little bit. It's going to bring a lot of people, you know, nearby states that don't have it yet. Um, but uh, we definitely have too concentrated of a economy based on shore tourism and gaming. So we need to diversify that. I think uh, the COVID pandemic, as harsh as it's been, has allowed people to disconnect from their commutes. So if we're able to get those type of individuals that make Philadelphia mainline North Jersey, New York wages, but to live in our area, I think over time that's going to help. And it's, they still want the amenities of the city, but if we could bring it to South Jersey, I think long-term that's how you're going to change that. It's not going to be next year or next couple of years. It's going to be decades for that to develop. Right. I don't think North is going to change anytime soon, mainly because just you only have certain areas that can be actual commercial. So you only have... Tilton Road between Fire and Fire and New Road that can really be commercial. Um, so you only have a small spot. The only area that can really make good from major redevelopment, Shore Mall area, and those two shopping centers across the street from each other. But you need a major roadway rework because the roadway over there is all it's all a mess. So and the only area that can really do anything would be up by Mays Landing, up by the Hamilton Mall, in between those two centers right there. Melissa, what do you have in mind? Like, what's in Cherry Hill you go to that you would like to see down here? Well, actually, I, I, I tell you what, what I, you know, would have in mind. Um, uh, what you were talking about earlier, and, and especially in the fact that, like, say, um, where the where the IMAX, where the Tilton Theater is, and and Ashley and whatever. Um, but. For example, if they did do something where as they put the retail on the bottom and then built up for the residential, like a lot of places are doing, you have such a big parking lot in which you refer to where you actually have that kind of space where you could go up um, and, and you know, re, refacade it and, and make it look more current. And then you're also bringing more people into the area um, and just, just trying to update that. Like, is that something that would be viable for that property? The, yeah. the racetrack area is probably the best spot for any kind of future big development. Yeah, I was I just going to suggest that. There. That might happen to the Hamilton Mall. The Hamilton Mall, which was like the last standing mall in this area, is in trouble. Um, and before the pandemic, they had plans to add more entertainment. They started doing it with extra restaurants around the mall on the edge. But they were talking about adding movie theaters and health clinics, like, you know, urgent care type. Uh, but now with COVID, that kind of put a halt. But, I mean, there's plenty of land back there. The old racetrack, like Milton said, would be perfect for that. Adding a hotel on site, um, adding more housing that we're in dire need of in the back. And, and it's right off the express where you get to Atlantic City in 20 minutes, get to Philly in 35 minutes from there. So that would be a perfect spot for. So th there's always building booms that happen. And right now we're far from any kind of building boom of going on of anything of any kind of sort. The last time we had a building boom was what? The two, three, four, five, and six? Maybe it's part of seven? Yeah, I would say that was mostly uh, focused on residential. In recent years, you've seen a lot more commercial building uh, than you have residential. In this area. Well, the casinos were popping up strong in that time period as well. Oh, that's true. When they were, when they were building up the uh, convention centers and everything else, that's, of course, when Brigada, not Brigada, Ocean. Rebel. <laughs> yeah, but no, if you see a certain uh, uh, retailer or service that you like in that area that you're not seeing here, uh, usually things hit Philly and then the Philly suburbs like the Mainline, Cherry Hill, Mount Laurel first. 
before they make it their way there. So if you see like a craze coming about, like donuts are becoming real popular, like high-end homemade donuts shops are trending. Um, and before that, you had the escape room craze. So like you could reach out to those people that are doing well in Cherry Hill to open another location down here. And that's how it starts. Like one guy does really well and everybody else wants to copy it and cut it to its profit margin. And, uh, you know, um, different specialty, like, you know, like supermarkets or that's definitely something that you could bring to the table by showing them the possibilities of this area and then with the population. And eventually it's kind of a, you know, the, uh, the old chicken and the egg, right? Does attractions bring people or do people cause attractions to develop i think it's a little bit of both so again pool okay thank you you're welcome thanks for the question uh yeah basically i do have one more question sure <laughs> um pertaining back to the to those um liquor licenses um i think i have an idea of the possible two places um but the liquor licenses are um assigned only to um to uh, that neighborhood, basically like Galloway, right? I mean, you can't no. you can't take they're, them anywhere else. They're uh, municipality specific, correct? Yeah. You can move them within the town, and even then, the the town has to approve. Like, they can't be too near of a school or a church. Um, but it could actually it could actually be applied to the place that just went out of business, but the liquor license was still available to be bought, and then once somebody else went back into that business with a viable thing that they could um, utilize that, they could. Oh, right. So yeah, the liquor license is uh, got to be held in a per person's name. Uh, they, they're they not attached to the building. A lot of times they come with a sale. If you're selling like a bar that's been established, you have to go through a uh, approval process with the New Jersey. And it's not easy. License. Not an easy approval process. And very rarely do new come up like uh, and it's based on population. So some areas that have had high populations in the past that may not have as high populations now have a lot of liquor licenses like Gloucester City, Atlantic City is another example. Um, but every time there's a population increase, uh, I think it's either 3,000 or 10,000, don't quote me, but that township has the right but not the obligation to increase and sell another license out to the public. Okay, cool. Yep. And for more, they can pass any way they want. Say that again. City, the city can wait. Are you for a city or person? Yeah, like a township can price them at whatever they want. I think. So the township can. If the township has a new license okay. that comes out. Awesome. Thanks. What do they price it at? Based on the market. Uh, or they it's, give it it's, out it's really depends. So Bentner, for the first time in its history since prohibition, allowed uh, restaurant licenses two years ago. So the new Tantucci's where the old True Value was on Venner Avenue opened up with a full liquor license. So they were selling them for 75,000, which is probably bare bones. Like at the height or the low of the last recession, Atlantic City licenses were going for like 25, 30,000. Um, but then when a new license opened up at Cherry Hill, it went for a cool million dollars just for the license. <laughs> That's a lot of margaritas and shots you have to sell to get your million back, in my opinion. But it just shows that demand for the areas, you know, it's pretty tight. These are restaurant licenses. Very rarely do you get new liquor store licenses, which are different. Any other questions? Who's ready to go and tackle some commercial deals? I and remember, am. if you don't want to tackle right. it, you call us. <laughs> Yeah, keep in mind your residential clients, uh, depending on their, uh, you know, background and what they're looking at, are, are a perfect example of being able to do commercials. So, especially if you're doing business on the island, those people who get involved with those level of properties, especially if it's a second property, you usually not always, but usually have some kind of ties to commercial real estate. Either they're investing in it, own it, um, are advisors like a lawyer, doctor, accountant, um, financial financer uh, in it. So keep in mind when you're doing uh, residential deals, the easiest way to find out about their commercial needs is, oh, what do you do for a living, right? Typical conversation. Oh, what business are you in? How's business these days? And most people will tell you fine, but if you dig a little deeper, they'll usually have some kind of need or problem that needs to be solved. 
So, and that's where you could come in. You don't have to be the end all be all. So in commercial, we kind of treat it like a, you know, a, a general practitioner versus a specialist. So most commercial people kind of specialize. Like I usually don't do a lot of multifamily deals, uh, but Noel does multifamily mix use all the time, but he doesn't really do a lot of leasing or industrial deals. So that's why we'll team up on a lot of things. But even within commercial, sometimes you have to find a specialist that can help your client out in a specific category. Like there's one guy in Limerick, PA, he's probably the top commercial agent in the whole region. Um, all he does is uh, RV uh, and mobile home parks, but he does it all over the country. And that's his specialty. He knows the clients that invest in it. He knows the park owners, what they should be valued at, the financing for it. And it's not talking about a single mobile home. He buys like an entire community that's paying rent on each spot. Be 3,000 trailers in the community, right? Yeah, those lot fees, you know, it starts becoming a pretty good business. If you work in the city, in Philadelphia, New York, whatever, you would have your own specialty for commercial. You wouldn't be doing a bunch of different things. It's too hard, too much information. Yeah, and it's hard to, uh, to know the, the players, right? The owners, the people looking to buy. So you get into that mode, you gotta be able to, speak their language and different you know an attorney looking for center city office space is different from a uh you know an industrial user in the suburbs you know they're looking for different requirements they uh, you know have different needs they speak different languages so with that in mind just like uh, your residential clients it's not too far off Any questions? Does, do you guys have our contact info? Mine or Noel's? So if you ever have any questions, you guys can reach out to us. Yep. You do? Yeah, I'm going to put my info in the chat box if you guys need my cell or my email. Don't hesitate to reach out to either one of us. We're always happy to help. You say you're always willing to help? Always. All right, guys. Any other questions for us? Remember, right. if you're not sure, don't just do it. Yeah, Find you don't want to. Last thing you want to do is is not represent your clients to your full abilities and get yourself in trouble by trying to get into something you don't really know. So always try. And a lot of times there's so much to learn in commercial. If you're not really passionate about it, willing to look things up and do the work, you're probably better off. Doing, in the time you're going to take to do one commercial deal, you're probably going to do like three residential deals. But financially, you're probably better off. Uh, work finding more residential clients and handing off the commercial deal. But we, for red agents, we also partner up and uh, we'll list things or work on a buyer lead together. So it really depends on how you guys are comfortable with and want to do it. But you guys have been great. Thank you for your participation. I want to see Melissa bringing in some Cherry Hill retailers and Baldo transforming the city skyline. Atlantic Thanks. City. It's been a really informative hour. I appreciate it. Feel free to reach out anytime. I got my cell and my email um, in the uh, chat. You guys can go ahead and take it down. No, I, what is, I don't understand what she's doing. Like, I don't even understand what that is. Right. Thanks All right, again, guys. guys. See you later, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye.